<laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, when people aren't here, I do the Tarzan swing between them, but. She's what? I'm sure she is. She, her wingspan is much longer than her legs. <laughs> you want to refill it all? Or no, I'm good. Bottle of water. We, we might take a, a break part okay. of the way through. Yeah. Is that all right? Okay. All right. I think we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Um, thank you all for coming. I am so appreciative that you are here. Um, I'm really excited to introduce you, uh, Dr. Gary Johnson, mm -hmm. and uh, he will ex he'll introduce himself. But um, I know for those of us who were uh, at Black River Falls on Saturday, um, we definitely benefited from his teaching. And as we were driving, um, it was his teaching was good enough. Where we actually talked about what he talked about almost the whole <laughs> way back to Black River Falls instead of hunting and farming. Uh -huh. And so that's impressive. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? So, um, anyway, we're really excited for you guys to hear what he has to offer. And um, we're going to open up in a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. And my heart and my desire is that this might allow us to look at ourselves as. Um, who we are as Sheldon Church of Christ, and also maybe what God is calling us to, maybe what God is calling us from, uh, maybe what God is, um, how God is working in our hearts. Because I really believe that God has a new plan for us. And so my, my desire is that we're going to open up with prayer, and the prayer is God, um, take away the stuff on our heart so we can hear it mm -hmm. for what you want us to do. Yeah. So would you join me as we pray? Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you right now, and we're so thankful for this church. It is a home. It is a family. It is a place where we can share um, our hardest times mm -hmm. and celebrate in the great triumphs. And Lord, we thank you for this gift. And right now, Lord, we just pray that your spirit might come and soften us so we can hear um, encouragement, truth, mm -hmm. um, how you were on a mission and Lord put a passion inside of us that we may share the same passion that you have mm -hmm. for this world yes. and Lord make that passion so strong that we can't fulfill it mm -hmm. and so Lord I pray for Gary right now as he teaches and um, Lord um, may you move mm -hmm. in a mighty way yes. in Jesus name we pray mm -hmm. Amen, Amen. Right. Thank you Jeremy Hey, folks, thanks for the invite to be with you tonight. We're going to have fun. Don't think that we're going to just sit here and go to sleep, all right? So I'm going to take two minutes to connect the dots as to uh, closing the gap. All right, so I was born in Muskegon, Michigan, right here on the lake, five minutes from the big lake. So uh, I am up north right now. Uh, anybody from Michigan, we always talk about going up north. So I'm up north in Wisconsin. I'm Scandinavian in a big way. Grandpa came from Sweden at the age of 26, emigrated, became an American citizen. His son, his name, my dad's name was John Johnson, and all of the Swedish neighbors called him Janne Janssen. All right, so I'm Swedish. I have an incredible Scandinavian work ethic. All right, now, uh, let me tell you, I'm gonna close the gap a little bit more. So at dinner tonight, I just happened to turn, we had a wonderful supper at Jeremy and Jennifer's, phenomenal home-cooked meal. I'm sure you've all been to their house for dinner, and if not, Jennifer's got your name on the list. You're going to be invited, I'm sure, <laughs> at least before Jesus gets back, okay, before he returns. Now, so we're sitting there, and I asked Jeremy if he knew of a certain minister. Now, before I tell you his name, this is what happened. Graduated from Lincoln with my graduate degree, and my very first church was there in Illinois, 15 miles from Lincoln Christian College and Seminary. Our boys were little, and uh, we went on a trip. We drove up through Michigan uh, and crossed the bridge, went into the UP, went through Sault Ste. Marie, drove around the north shore of Lake Superior, came down here through Duluth, Minnesota, came down here through Wisconsin, and we stopped for church. On a Sunday, slept Saturday night at the preacher's house, came to church on Sunday, and his name 
was Ron Jarrett. You know where we were at church? Right here. And I didn't realize that until supper tonight. I said, so Jeremy, do you know Ron Jarrett? <laughs> and he connected the dots for me. So I just want you to know it's good to be back, okay? <laughs> so what we're going to do tonight, we're going to have a good time. You better have your Bibles out, whether it's on a phone or uh, in the good book, uh, something you look at with paper. But what we're going to do is talk about Jesus on mission. Now, uh, tonight at dinner, Sarah said that she really likes biology. And when Sarah mentioned biology, I got to thinking, what's ology mean? Anybody? Ology, that suffix. It means what? Study of. And then we, it's the study of bi, but we have to put the whole Greek word there, B-I-O-S. Bios in Greek means life. So when you and I take biology class, it's the study of life systems, okay? So what we're doing tonight, and we're going to do it very quickly, we're doing Christology. It's the study of Christ in a very deeper way. Now, I took this class in 1992 when I was doing my MDiv uh, from a guy named Dr. Johnny Presley, a brilliant man of God. He, he spent 13 weeks, 36 hours of talking, 36 hours on six verses of Scripture in Philippians chapter 2. And so what I'm giving you tonight is not 36 hours. We're going to limit it to a little more than 60 minutes, and then we're going to get up and stretch our legs, and then we're going to come back and talk about, so what? What difference does that make right here at Sheldon Church of Christ? Because we, whenever we open the word, we got to see how it speaks into our lives, and the rubber has to meet what? The road. All right, now I'm going to push pause here. As we spend time together, in the name of Jesus, I give you permission to participate. Be more Pentecostal and less Presbyterian, okay? So uh, I'm going to be asking questions as we go through. So we're going to do Jesus on mission. Now, <clears throat> We're going to start wide at the top of the funnel, and we're going to come down to an incredible discovery. And just as your pastor prayed, we're praying that the Holy Spirit's going to change us before we walk out. That maybe even tonight's going to be a defining moment. I can tell you this. When I took Christology in 1992, my life changed forever when I understood what Jesus did at this incredible place at a deeper level. All right, here we go. Starting wide. So John 3, 16, we all know that, right? Say it with me. For God what? So loved what? The world that he what? Gave his only son that whosoever what? Believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So God so loved. Don't forget that. God so loved. Now we know this one too, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us, exactly. God demonstrated his love. So we got God so loved, God demonstrated his love. Now, this one you might not know by heart, so you might want to go over to Jonah chapter 4. Now, there are four chapters in Jonah, and verse 11 is the very last verse of the story of Jonah. So let me just really quickly recapsulate uh, the story. And what we got going on, chapter 1, we got a preacher named Jonah. God says, go to Nineveh. He says, nope, not going. Talk to the hand. So everybody obeys God. The wind obeys God. The waves obey God. The sailors obey God. They throw him overboard. Even the fish obeys God, swallows Jonah. Everybody obeyed God except the preacher, all right? So the preacher gets burped up on the beach, and he goes to Nineveh. He preaches a revival, and thousands of people repent and turn to God. He's in ch uh, now at the end, he's chapter 4, he's waiting. He's out there in the hot sun, and he's waiting for God to call down fire on Nineveh, much like what he did on the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it didn't come. And he is fit to be tied. In the last verse, notice what it says there. God, God is the last one to speak in that story. And what does he say? Should I not be what? Concerned for that great city. 120,000 people and many cattle as well who cannot tell their right hand from their left. All right, so God was concerned for, for Nineveh. Was he concerned about the unemployment rate, the inflation rate, the price of gasoline? No. What was he concerned about? Anybody? People. He was concerned, here it is, about lost people. 
God so loved that he gave. God demonstrates his love for us. Should I not be concerned for that great city? So this is elementary. God loves lost people. God loves lost people more than he does the color of this carpet. And now I've been a preacher for 40 years, been around the block a few times, and I can tell you, churches have split over the color of carpet. Nothing matters more to God than lost people. All right, now, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You are smart people. All right. So here we go. Ready? All right. A little bit deeper still in the tri in the funnel. John 15, 13, night before Jesus goes to the cross, and he says, no greater love has anyone than this. Finish it for me. It's exactly correct that he laid down his life for his friend. He's talking about himself. No greater love has anyone this than he laid down his life for his friend. All right, there's that love thing again. Hmm. All right, Mark 10, Mar uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, they tell the same story from three different angles. This young guy comes running up to Jesus and falls at his feet, and we call him the who, the blank, blank, blank. That's exactly correct. Rich young ruler. You get a free cookie on your way out, okay? The rich young ruler. All right. And he says, Lord or teacher, rabbi, tell me what must I do to be saved? And the interesting angle in Mark 10, this is, this is huge. Let's connect the dots. While Jesus is walking on planet Earth in the flesh, it says in Colossians 2 verse 9, in Christ, the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. The fullness of God, the deity, dwells in Jesus in bodily form. So while Jesus walked on planet Earth, not only was he fully flesh, but he was fully God. All right, so now that means he's omniscient. Now what's omniscient mean? Knows everything. Exactly correct. Tim, right? Yes, Tim and Nancy, correct? No, Tim and Linda, 50% oh, right there, but I got Tim. All right, okay. So uh, he's, he's already knowing what's gonna happen in this moment. The young guy's gonna say, thanks, but no thanks, Jesus. Talk to the hand, not interested in the offer, you know, sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, then come follow me. No, not interested. Jesus already knows he's going to be rejected by the rich young ruler, but verse 21, did anybody look that up? What's it say there? Jesus looked at him and loved him. Incredible. Jesus looked at him and loved him, even though he was going to reject him. So Jesus loves somebody who said no. He loves atheists. He loves people who do not believe in him. He looks at them and loves them. And then over in Matthew 9, uh, this is where it says, of him, when he saw the crowds, he had what on them? Anybody remember? Compassion, that's right. He had compassion on them. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And that word compassion is a great word in Greek. It means large intestine. It means bowel. So when he saw broken, hurting people who were far from God, he had feeling that came welling up from deep within him for those people. So let's put it all together, like father, like son, Jesus loves lost people. Are we on the same page so far? Okay, all right. So we're about right here. Okay, now here we go. Jesus knew his mission. This is huge. Jesus knew his mission. In 1 Peter chapter 1, there's a very important uh, phrase that we've got to land on. I, I've got it highlighted in my Bible. I've got it underlined. And sometimes we think of it as the fine print. We just read over it too quickly. And in verse 20, you'll notice in your Bible that it says that Jesus was chosen before something happened. Anybody got it there? What happened? Jesus was chosen before something took place. Ah, yes, before creation took place. So think about that. Before, before God said, let there be light, Jesus said yes. He was chosen before the creation of the world. Might be that you're using a, a version that says he was chosen before the foundation of the earth was laid. Isn't that incredible? And when did God lay that foundation? In Genesis chapter 1. 
So before God laid the foundation of the earth, Jesus said, I'm in. Anybody, uh, I'm in Club Med. Leah and I are in Club Med. That would be Medicare. We got our Medicare cards, all right? Those of us in Club Med, we remember Sunday night, Mission Impossible, 9 o'clock Eastern time zone. Don't know. Anyway, your mission, what was the name? Remember his name? Jim, that's right. Another free cookie tonight. Your mission, Jim. Should you, should you choose to accept it? All right, now all of you who are younger, uh, the movies, Mission Impossible movies, it's not Jim, it's who? Your mission, Ethan, Ethan Hunt. Should you what? Choose to accept it. So just think with me. God the Father saying, your mission, son, is to go and die for them. And Jesus said, yes. He wasn't forced to go. He wasn't, uh, he, he had freedom of decision. He chose to die for us. And that happened when? Before creation. That's going to come out. Uh, in a little while, why that's so very important. Now, Luke 19, 10, he says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost, the lost. All right, there's his mission. Now, quick question, yes or no. Was Jesus the master physician? Yes, absolutely. Bible calls him the master physician. Was Jesus a master teacher? Oh, yes, undeniably. Those are secondary roles. Not everybody was healed by him. Not everybody heard his Sermon on the Mount or teaching. But everybody on planet Earth is offered the gift of eternal life. His primary mission was to seek and to save what was lost. Now, over in Luke, this is, and obviously Luke was a what by trade? A physician. This is very interesting. Who wrote the most material in the New Testament? Luke, absolutely. A Bible college student said that. I heard it. Yes, Bible college graduate, a professor of Bible college. Luke wrote what two books? Luke and Acts. And when we add the content of those two books together, there's more content there than the 13 books of Paul. Paul wrote the most number of books. Luke wrote the greatest content. And here's something to think about. In Luke 9.51, it says, as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Is that what your Bible says? Okay, now, to be taken up. What's that mean? When the time approached for Jesus to be taken up. Anybody? Exactly, ascension. That is exactly correct. So for him to ascend into heaven, he first has to what? die on a cross, be buried in a tomb, and be raised from the dead before he can ascend. So this is interesting. Luke 9.51 is the beginning of the end of his life. Luke 9.51. And there are 24 chapters in Luke. And what's interesting, he arrives in Jerusalem in Luke 19.28. It's the triumphal entry. So from Luke 9.51, when he resolutely sets out for Jerusalem, and that word resolutely, in Greek it means he took aim for the cross. Yeah, it might be that you're using a version that, version that says he set his face to Jerusalem. It's like you go deer hunting and you got that gun and you're taking aim for that deer. You might be using a scope. Jesus scoped out the cross and he let nothing get in his way. Now, this is interesting. Here's a little factoid. From Luke 9.51, when he, his last journey to Jerusalem starts right there in Luke 9.51, his last walk to Jerusalem, and he arrives in 1958. Ready? That is about a third of the content of Luke. Think about that. See, in hermeneutics, that's a class meaning the science of interpreting the Bible there are rules that we follow in interpreting the Bible. And one of those rules is if there's a whole bunch of content about one thing, God wants it to capture our attention. So we're going to be looking at some details that maybe over time we just didn't realize. That's where we're going as we keep going deeper in this funnel. So Jesus not only knew his mission, and when did he accept that mission, anybody? 
at the very beginning before, before creation. Hold on to that. All right, now, not only did Jesus know his mission, and it was all about lost people because he loved lost people just like his father loved lost people, he protected his mission. Now, this next, what's going to come up on the screen is a game changer. You and I need to just put on our theological thinking cap here because this is a game changer. Jesus, in Matthew 26, verse 18, he sends his guys into Jerusalem to make preparations for the Last Supper. And if somebody's got a good outdoor voice, I'd like you to read verse 18, please. Somebody got that? Yep, go right ahead. Thank you. He's going to celebrate what holiday? His the Passover. Now, what's the Passover? Anybody? And just dawned on me. Hey, Dr. Jeremy, could you get me? Do you have like a whiteboard or something? Uh, or a pad of paper? There's uh, something I want to draw in about 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You are a servant. Okay. Now, he's going he's gonna to die during what holiday? Passover. What was Passover, anybody? What does that commemorate? Remember the holiday? What happened? That's right. And what, what, where were they when that happened? In Egypt, exactly. So we go all the way back to the Old Testament, book of Exodus, and there were how many plagues? Ten. And this was plague number ten, death of the firstborn male. That's right. Male, whether sons or cattle. Now, so God says you take a lamb, you kill the lamb, you take that lamb's blood, you put it on the doorframe of the house, you roast the lamb, you eat the lamb, you stay in that house because the death angel, when he sees that blood of the lamb, is going to pass over. There's that holiday. And Jews to this day, an Orthodox Jew, that is the most beloved holiday of the year. Just kind of like what holiday for us? Christmas. They work to observe, to observe that holiday. Now, so it says right there in the text, my appointed time is near. It sounds like an appointment. What we need to understand is during the week of Passover, there was one day during the week when they would kill all of those lambs. And it was called the Day of Unleavened Bread. More on that in just a little while. So on that day, Jesus had to die. And this is now his third Passover since being immersed by John. That's how we use the calculation. Jesus had an earthly ministry of three and a half years. This is now the third Passover. And at that third Passover, he's going to die. Who set that appointment with him, do you think? God. Absolutely. His appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples. And that means he has to die. Ready? Here it comes. He has to die on a certain day. Not a year earlier, not a year later, not at another festival, not on any other day. It has to be the day of unleavened bread at that third Passover, and God has set that appointment. He has to die on a certain day. Now, here's the second thing we want to know. So hold, hold, stay with me on this. It's going to make sense. We know John 3.16 real well, but John 3.14 says, as Moses lifted the serpent on the stake, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Well, what do you mean by that? What did, when Jesus said that, what, what did he mean? As Moses lifted the serpent on the stake, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. It's exactly correct. He's, he's indicating how he's going to die. Crucifixion. And notice it's John 3. This is early in his ministry. This is shortly after his being immersed. So early on, he's telling everybody, hey, I've got to be lifted up. And then in John 12, if you just look up John 12 and you take a glance in verse 33, there's a phrase. He's talking about being lifted up. If I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men after me. It's not, it's not a worship text. And a lot of people will use that. Oh, we're going to lift up Jesus. And it's not a worship text. 
It is a crucifixion text because in verse 33, do you see what it says there? Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. So John gives us the interpretation of verse 33. What that means is this, not only did Jesus have to die on a certain day, but Jesus had to die in a certain way. He's making a prophetic statement. I have to die by what? Crucifixion. Cannot die by being killed by a spear. Can't die by being thrown off the hill at Nazareth. Can't die by stoning. I, and he's making a prophetic statement. He's saying this long before. He's going to be on that cross back in John 3, 14. So think with me for a moment. If Jesus had died on any other day, in any other way, he would be a false what? Prophet. He would be a false prophet. A liar. And if he had been a false prophet, a liar, he could not be our savior. Do you see that? He had to fulfill his mission. It would have been mission not accomplished. And guess what? We wouldn't be here tonight. If Jesus had not fulfilled his mission, if he had failed at it, we would not be here. There would be no church. There would be no Christian colleges, no Christian orphanages, no Christian hospitals. The only hope of humankind would be to die and burn like a twig because Jesus was the only plan, his death on a cross for the forgiveness of our sin. And when did God establish that plan? Before creation. See how huge this is? He knew his mission, and then he did everything to protect that mission. He took aim for the cross in Jerusalem, and he's not going to let anything get in his way. So he protected his mission in four specific ways. We're going to fly quickly through this. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Okay. All right. So first of all, in Matthew 12, 14 through 16, if somebody would get that ready, I'm going to have you read it out loud. Uh, and then if somebody would get John 7, verse 1 ready. And if somebody, please, last one would get John 11, verses 53, 54 ready. And uh, we're going to read all three of them, and you're going to make an observation because they all say the same thing. And many times when we're reading these verses, we, um, we miss this little detail. We miss this detail. All right? Anybody want to read one of the uh, – Matthew 12. Got that one ready? Thank you. Outdoor voice now, okay? King is coming. Oh, Matthew. That's okay. No problem. You, you find, we want you to read it, okay? Matthew 12. Uh, somebody got John 7, verse 1. Got that one ready? Anybody? After this, Jesus traveled around Mm -hmm. He wanted to stay out of Judea because what was waiting there for him? The Jews were waiting to what? Kill him. They were plotting to, uh, to kill him. John 11, 53, 54. And then we're going to come back to Matthew, okay? What do we got there? John 11, 53, 54. Yep, go for it, Connie. Judy. <laughs> Same family. Uh -huh. I'm close. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So the Jews were waiting to what? Kill him. So he removed himself from that place. Hmm. Sounds like John 7, verse 1. Now Matthew 12, uh, verse 14 through 16, please. So again, the people were wanting to what? Kill him. So what we want to understand here, here's number one, how he, he protected his mission. Jesus withdrew. 
He looked up ahead on the road. He could tell there was danger there waiting for him. People were wanting to kill him, crucify him, or excuse me, to uh, assassinate him. So he avoided that place. Ready? Number two. Here we go. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 45, 46. Somebody wants to read that for us, please. 21, 45, and 46. What do we have there? Uh, the people held that he was a prophet, and the Jews, they wanted to arrest him so that they could want him, kill him. And here's the second way he protected his mission. He surrounded himself with friends, people who loved him. They were kind of like a secret service detail, a security detail. They're not going to let anybody get to their Jesus. The Jews couldn't get to him to kill him because he was surrounded by people who uh, held him to be a prophet. Number three, the way that he protected his mission. Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 33, 34, Curtis, if you'll have that one ready. And then Luke 19, 10, while he's getting that, remember this one? We recited it a moment ago. Jesus said the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Uh-huh, the lost. All right, now, hold that thought. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Uh, what do we got there in Mark 4? Ah, oh, very good. He, his favorite teaching method was parables. parables. And remember, a parable was a cryptic kind of a story with a punchline. And it even said there in Mark chapter 4 that when he was alone with his disciples, when they went indoors, shut the door, closed the windows, he explained to them what he meant. So, so just imagine he's using a parable with the crowd and the Pharisees are there going, is he talking about us again? Is that one about us? I, I bet that one's about us. And so they go into that private place with his disciples and they go, Rabbi, what's the punchline mean? Come on, explain that one to us. We didn't get it. So we have to remember that a parable was not always clear in meaning. And there's a purpose for it. There's a reason why he did that. And then think with me, for the son of who? Man. Why didn't Jesus say son of God? He was born by a woman, yeah. Uh, he was certainly human, fully human. Why did he say son of man? If he were out Pharisees and the teachers of the law. What would happen? They would stone him based on what crime or what sin? Blasphemy. And how many witnesses would it require? Two or more. Exactly. So Jesus, here's our third way that he protected his mission. He's, he's got to get to where? The cross. He's got to get to the cross on a certain day. He spoke carefully. He was very careful about how he spoke. He did not uh, in any way want to prematurely anger the people who hated him, who wanted to kill him. Now, we're going to see in just a moment, the last week of his life, Jesus is going to get right to the point. You den of vipers, uh, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. He's going to get right to the point during the last seven days of his life. But he's waiting to turn up the burner on his direct speech because he cannot allow them to be so angry that they're going to kill him. Now, we're going to be here in this fourth week of his life. This is the fourth way that he protected his mission. He expertly uh, managed, directed every detail of the last week of his life. And we're going to break it down in just a minute. But just remember why this is so important. If we're over here in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, everything is how good? Very good. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were made in their vast array. It's all good. Now, Genesis 3, verse 1, who shows up in the garden? Satan. And here's where sin happens, and then God punishes Adam, Eve, and Satan. 
And this is very interesting from chapter three on throughout the scripture, whenever anybody is punished, God explains why. He's telling those three why they're being punished. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, hey, David, this is why the sword will never leave your house. It's because you took a, a man's wife and she was not your own. Uh, when Moses and Aaron, they struck the rock rather than speaking to the rock. And what did God say? Hey, Moses, this is why you're not going into the promised land. You did, you struck the rock when you should have spoken. God always explains. Isn't it interesting on judgment day? Even in Matthew, Jesus says, hey, uh, at that last judgment, uh, I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. Hungry, you gave me something to eat. See, even judgment day, there's going to be an explanation as to why you and I receive the gift of life. And those who have rejected Jesus, they're going to be uh, told why they're being punished. Now, all of that, remember, right here, God says in Genesis 3 to the serpent, you, in verse 15, you will strike the heel of the offspring of the woman, meaning you're going to make life miserable for the Messiah. That would be Jesus. But he, the Messiah, is going to what? Anybody? Crush your head. So from that moment on, Satan is on the hunt. He's looking for who? The Messiah. He doesn't have a clue who the Messiah is, but he's going to take the Messiah out before the Messiah takes him out. So we fast forward. It's now Luke chapter 2. Hey, there was an angel uh, appeared to the shepherds by night. Uh, and the angel said unto them, fear not. And just time out here, just real quick. Ladies, please do not buy Christmas cards from Hallmark. They are wrong. When you get a Christmas card with a blonde angel on the cover, not an angel. Okay, Hallmark's got it all wrong. Every time an angel appeared, what did the angel say? Fear not. Why did the angel say fear not? Because the people were afraid, right? Hey, fear not. Don't be afraid. That angel struck fear. Can you imagine if that angel were a blonde bombshell? Those shepherd guys, they wouldn't say, hey, baby. They wouldn't say fear, or the angel wouldn't say fear not. The, the shepherd guys would say, hey, baby, get over here by the, keep warm by the campfire. All right, come on. Uh, an angel was a righteous warrior of God, a righteous warrior of God. So right here in Luke 2, here's this announcement that the Messiah has been born. And what happens? Bam. Satan doesn't know the identity of the Messiah, but he certainly stirs the hate in the heart of somebody named Herod to kill all the boys two years of age and younger in Bethlehem. See, already, as soon as he knows the Messiah has been born, he goes after him. What happened after the immersion of Jesus? Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. He goes immediately into the desert, and what happens there? Satan goes after him. And from that time on, he's going to do everything he can to make him fail at mission. He's got to keep him from getting where? To the cross. So he's going to try to take him out in any way possible. Have him thrown off the hill at Nazareth by stirring the hatred among the Jews. Have him stoned. Have him speared to death. He's going to do all that he can to keep him from the cross. All right, so that's why Jesus is so intent on protecting his mission because he loves somebody. Who does he love? That would be us. That would be us. As well as everybody else. God loves lost people. Jesus loves lost people. So right now, just think about Sheldon and beyond of all the people who do not know Jesus as Savior. They're going to die and burn like a twig. Do we care about that or not? We're going to unpack that before we leave tonight, before we get in those cars and drive away. This is going to make sense for our individual lives. You just stay with me, okay? All right, now we're going to go to Mark chapter 11. This is very, very, very important. This fourth way that he protected his mission. So in Mark 11, you'll see that it's the triumphal entry. And what happens here is that um, uh, verse... 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem, and he went where? To the temple. And what holiday is this? Passover. This is Passover. So Jerusalem would be filled with 
hundreds of thousands of pilgrims who have come from all over for Passover. Remember, there were three holidays uh, a year when men, Jewish men, had to go to meet before God in Jerusalem, and this is one of them. So the city would have been filled with tens of thousands of pilgrims, husbands and wives and their children. Remember, Jesus went when he was a boy aged 12. Parents took him. All right, so he goes to the temple. Uh, he looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out uh, of Bethany, uh, out to Bethany with the 12. Now, who lived in Bethany? Mary and Martha did, and they hit. Jesus had just done an incredible thing there in that family. What did he do? Raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, it says nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John that he stayed with them, but I think it's safe to speculate that he may have stayed there because, remember, there, there aren't a whole bunch of sleep-ins. Are there some inns? Yes, but it's not like there's a Ramada Inn, a Holiday Inn, etc. When you went to Passover, you would stay with whom? Friends and family, absolutely. So it is legitimate to, to assume that he stayed with Mary and Martha and Lazarus out there in Bethany. And notice it says it was already getting late. What's that referring to? It's already getting late. It's evening. The sun is beginning to set. Very good. So now notice in verse 12, the next day they were leaving where? Bethany. This is very important. They're leaving Bethany, and he's going to Jerusalem. Now, seeing a fig tree, he's hungry. Now, what's the rest of that story? What's he do to the fig tree? He curses it, and what happens? It dies, withers from its roots. Now, hold that thought. Verse 15, on reaching Jerusalem. So they leave Bethany. Here's this tree in Bethany. No figs on it. He curses it. It dies. And then they walk into Jerusalem. And where do they go? To the temple. Verse 15, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area, and here's where he uh, turns the money-changing tables over. Is this the first time he did it? No. He did it at the beginning of his ministry, and now he's doing it at the end of his ministry. And, and why this is so important, just let's say all of us lived in Capernaum, okay? We are all fishermen, and we live up there by uh, the Sea of Galilee, and it's uh, Passover time, and we all decide we're all related to one. We're going to Jerusalem for Passover. We're going to walk there. It's going to take us a few days. We're taking the kids. We're singing. We're clapping. It's a hail. It's a holiday, and we have to take an animal with us. What do we have to take along? A lamb. That's exactly correct. And so uh, one family might have a lamb for them, and these relatives, a lamb for them. We get to Jerusalem. It's now the day of unleavened bread when we're going to sacrifice our Passover lambs. We go to the temple, the guys do. We give the lamb to the priest because only the priest can sacrifice them. And they go, oh, yuck. What, what did you do to this lamb? It is, what's the B word? Blemished. Did you drag this thing through the mud? What did you do? It's blemished. Well, what are we going to do? We got to sacrifice the lamb. It's, it's time. Well, it's a good thing for you that down to the left in our, our east wing, we have our certified unblemished lamb department. Get over there, hurry up, and buy one of those lambs and get back here. So we take off, we're over there, got, got to take up a love offering real quick, and we take up our love offering, we hand it to the certified lamb guy, and he, you can't use that here. Well, what, what do you mean? This is, we, we use this all the time. Uh, back home in Capernaum, well, you can't use this here. Why, why can't we use that money? Anybody? It's not temple money. That's exactly correct. It's not temple money. What's wrong with our coins? What? They're filthy? Ah, what do you mean, Caesar, Curtis? Ah, Caesar's image is there. Remember, Jesus saying, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. So Caesar's image is on that money. Ah, Remember the top 10 list? Not David Letterman's, the top 10 list. God's. What's right there at the top of the list? You shall not make any graven images. So the lamb guy goes, that's a graven image. That's an idol. You can't use that money here. Well, what are we going to do? It's the only money we have. Well, lucky for you, down in the West Wing, we've got our money changing uh, department. Get down there, exchange your money, get over here, buy your certified unblemished lamb, and get in there to the priest. So we go over there. The temple, are you ready for this? The temple was the number one economic engine 
of Israel. The number one money maker in their country. And whoever controlled the temple was the wealthiest. You have Pharisees who are doctors of the law. And you have Sadducees who were the wealthy business people. And whoever controlled the temple became incredibly wealthy. And Jesus turns those tables over. He upsets the economic apple cart of Jerusalem. And what was their response? He says, you've made it a den of robbers. Verse 18, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, they heard this and they began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. They began looking for a way to kill him. They're upset with him. And then what did he do? Verse 19, when evening came, they went where? Out of the city. So Jesus goes into the city. He upsets them. He confronts them directly. He's not beating around the bush anymore. And then the sun's beginning to set. And he goes out of the city. Where did he go? Do we know where he went? Pardon? How do we know that, Connie? Mother of Judy. <laughs> it's a guess. Oh, okay. We don't we don't have to guess. Why why did we what exactly are you related to this family? Okay, all right. So what happens there is the fig tree again. Notice verse 20 in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree. So what we want to see there is a pattern. It's nighttime. Jesus goes out here to Bethany uh, to be with friends, perhaps Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It's now the sun has come up. They go into where? Jerusalem, to the temple, to confront the Pharisees, the doctors of the law. The sun is beginning to set. Where does he go? He slips out of Dodge, and he comes over here to Bethany. Why would that be? Simple. Bad things happen in the dark. They don't have security systems. And that city is full of hundreds of thousands of Jews, many of whom who want to what? Kill him. And they know he's there. Not only do they see him in the temple, but they know he's there because he's a good Jewish rabbi and he has to obey Jewish law. He has to be there. So as the sun is setting and it's getting dark, he's slipping out of Dodge to go to a safe place. Jesus expertly managed, directed the last week of his life. Let's go over to Luke chapter 22. In Luke 22. Now, this is very interesting. So this is the pattern going on all week long, all week long. It is an emotional roller coaster. And in Luke 22, notice in verse 7, then came the day of unleavened bread. There it is, the day of unleavened bread on which what has to happen? The Passover lamb has to be what? Sacrifice. There it is. Now, before we talk that through, Curtis, would you please look up Exodus chapter 12? And I just want you to have that ready. I'm going to ask you to read a verse from there in just a minute. So here we go. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? He replied, as you enter the city, what city would that be? Anybody? Jerusalem, as you enter the city. So he's got to eat Passover in the city. Got to eat in the city. A man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where's the guest room where I'll eat the Passover with my disciples? He'll show you a large upper room, all finished, make preparations there. And it happened. They did that. Now, what stands out in those instructions? Is there anything odd to you in those instructions? What? He most certainly did. Every detail of that encounter, he predicted it. What else? Something sticks out like a sore thumb. Jar of water. What about the jar of water? That's right. Ah, it's carried by a man. Another free cookie tonight. That's exactly correct. What happens is who carried water? Women did. Jesus met a woman at the well. Now, just stop and think this through with me. He's going into the city. Are there extra people in the city? Absolutely. Hundreds of thousands. Josephus and other historians talked about the enormous crowd for Passover. And Jesus has to eat that meal where? In Jerusalem. Can't eat it out in Bethany. Old Testament law in the presence of God, the city of God. Now, so 
they're going into the city and there, there are hundreds of thousands of people. All the guys, they didn't have on light green shirts or blue shirts, uh, gray shirts. They all had one single clothing color, dirty, all right? And they had one single kind of a haircut, long, curls by the side of their head. They're going into the city. What guy? Who, who, who? Oh, there he is. It's the guy with the jar of water that he's carrying. He's the one. He would stick out like a sore thumb. So that guy takes him to the house. He, he evidently knows the address. He doesn't have to know anything more than that. He takes him to the house and goes, here's the house. I can get this thing off my head. And then he leaves and they go in the house and they make preparations. Now hold that thought. Exodus 12 is the first Passover. Verse 6. Take special care of the chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. Ah, when? At? When's twilight? That's evening. The sun's beginning to set. So now just connect the dots. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims, that means tens of thousands of lambs, are going to be slaughtered when? At? twilight as the sun is setting not a moment before at twilight and what happens the priest stands over the uh, goat or the lamb cuts the throat gathers the blood what's, what's he do with the blood sprinkles it where around the altar and then what's he going to do with this dead lamb it's got to be what yes but is he going to do it these tens of thousands of Lambs? No. Why are you shaking your head no? Who's going to do it? We are. He's going to give it back to us. That's right. It's our lamb. What do we have to do to it? We got to skin it. We got to gut it. We got to then microwave it, right? Uh, we're going to boil it, flash fry it. What are we going to do? How are we going to cook it, Jeremy? We're going to roast it. And the, when is all of this happening? At twilight. What time are we going to eat supper? It's going to be late, that's right. By the time we roast an entire lamb, it's going to be hours later. So if all of this is happening at 6 p.m. at sundown, by the time we get our lamb, we get to where it is that we're staying there in Jerusalem, it's going to be a late supper. We're going to be eating 11 o'clock midnight, and it's usually very dark at midnight at 11 p.m. Where does Jesus have to be? In Jerusalem. Who's looking for him? The Jews. To what? To kill him. They know he's got to be in that city that night. They know he has to be there. And so why all that trouble with the jar of water? It was a what? That place, that upper room, it was a what? All that trouble, all prearranged. It was a safe place. It, nobody could know where he was. Because if they knew where he was, what would they do? They'd kill him. All right, one more observation. Now they're in the upper room. John 13, you'll notice this is where they have the um, uh, account. Verse 2, the evening meal or the meal was already being served. You see that? The meal's already being served. That means the food's on the table. And then Jesus gets up from the table to, to do what? Wash their feet. This is very interesting. In verse 15, he says, I've done this to give to you an example. That's part of it, yes. But there is another layer that we do not want to miss. Feet washing, was that very important in their culture? Oh, yes, absolutely. Two seasons, dry and rainy, and their streets were very narrow. And uh, in the summer, poof, 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 all that dust. In the rainy season, slush, 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 and there was more than rainwater there, if you know what I mean. So when you went into somebody's house, the very first thing that happened was your feet were washed. And who did the washing? Who? A servant, exactly. A servant did that. Many times it was the servant at the lowest rung of the ladder, so to speak. The very fact that the meal is already being served, what does that tell us? And their feet are not washed. There were no servants. Exactly. Why were there no servants? A secret. So all those servants, what? 
They were gone. They had the night off. Because a lowly servant, a slave, could easily be what? Bribed. Could easily be bribed. Nobody can know that he's there. So here they are at that table, and they have, they're reclining. And Jesus gets up from the table, and he goes around. This is the table with all the roast lamb and the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread. And he washes their feet. These were called tricliniums meaning couches, in a formal meal like this, a Passover feast. And so Jesus gets up and he washes their feet. Now, what's very interesting, he, he's troubled. If you look, he's troubled. And he says, one of you is going to what? Betray me. Who, Lord? Who's going to betray you? And he says, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread after dipping it in the dish. You see it there, verse 21 and following? Then taking the bread, dipping it in the dish, he gives it to who? To Judas. And Jesus says, go and do what you have to do and do it quickly. So out he goes. Now, how long would that have taken? Hey, it's the one to whom I give this piece of bread after dipping in the dish. Dip, go and do what you have to do. And he's out the door. See how cryptic that is? Who is it, Lord? And what if he had said, it's Judas? What would have happened? <laughs> Lights out, Judas. He wouldn't have gotten out of that room. But Judas has to get out of the room in order to what? Betray him to the authorities. See how Jesus is expertly managing every detail of his last seven days. So then chapter 18, he goes to Gethsemane and Judas knew where to take him because it says in chapter 18, verse 2, Jesus often met with his disciples there. So he goes to Gethsemane, and here's the arrest. Peter takes out that sword. He goes to defend Jesus. He takes off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. Put your sword away. But what did Peter do for a living? He was a fisherman. He knew how to throw, throw a fishing net, not throw a sword. I believe he was going for the head, and he missed. You put the sword away. So Jesus took control of what could have become a riot. And what could have happened during the riot? He could have been killed, and he would have failed at his mission. He's taken into custody, and we know the rest of the story. Is that not incredible? He knew his mission. His mission was to die for us and for everybody in every house in Sheldon and beyond and in Indianapolis, in Ukraine because of his indescribable what? Love. All right, stay with me. One last thing theologically, and then we're gonna take a break, and we're gonna come back and finish with a life application. Not only did he know his mission, accepting it, not only did he protect his mission, but he paid the full price of his mission. Ob obviously, you have musicians here in the church so if I were to draw this, what is that in music? A crescendo mark. What's that mean? To get louder. I believe that the suffering of Jesus increased. His suffering increased. Think of it this way. There was a physical cost for our salvation. That was clearly his impalement, his scourging. That was... Uh, his uh, suffering at the hands of the Roman centurions. Uh, and what you and I, all we would have to do is get Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ out and watch what cinematography portrays before us. His physical suffering was off the chart, indescribable. We, we cannot fathom that, the physical pain. But it gets worse. There was an emotional cost. Think with me, who is on that cross? In Genesis 1, the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. Remember that? So the Holy Spirit was involved in creation. And God said, let there be light. And God said, and God said. So God is, the Father is involved in creation. Colossians chapter 1, everything was made by him and for him, speaking of whom? Jesus. Jesus was involved in creation. 
So on that cross is the creator of all those to whom he gave the breath of life. The creature is doing that to the creator. And he is being incredibly humiliated. The, the emotional cost was indescribable. He's hanging there how? Does he have any clothes on? No, he's naked. Juice had three great fears. One, being naked. Where does that come from? Anybody want to take a guess? The Garden of Eden. Who told you you were naked? God asked uh, Adam and Eve. Who told you you were naked? From that time on, Jews feared being naked. Do you remember a guy by the name of Noah? Remember that, that story? He builds a cruise liner, goes on a world cruise. He gets off the cruise ship. He plants a vineyard. He makes some wine, and he gets drunk. And what happens? He's seen naked by one of his boys, and boy, dad goes ballistic. Being naked in front of people was one of the great fears of the Jews. And then being hung on a tree, you are under God's curse. It says that in Deuteronomy. So when people are going by, look at that. You are under God's curse. You're hung on a tree. You are stark naked. And a third great fear of the Jews, not being buried. Remember when Abraham's wife Sarah died. He insisted on buying the cave at Machpelah to bury his beloved wife, Sarah. Father Abraham, from that time on, it was brought into the culture, Jewish culture. Bear. Remember when others died, Joseph, when he died, what did they do? They took his bones. When Jacob died, they took his bones and buried. Jesus is going to die, and they're going to bury him. So it was feared that you would not be buried. The, the Romans are saying, if you mess up, you're going to be like that person. And they left corpses on the cross to become food for the birds of the air. So here he is, and people would be cursing him as they're going by. They're, they're calling him all manner of name. And there was a great emotional cost. And Jesus, he could have called it off at any time. I could uh, call my father and have him send what? Angels, legion of angels. But he didn't. But here's the greatest cost of all. And this is where we have to understand the six hours on the cross, the spiritual cost. What we want to remember is that Jesus is on the cross from the third hour, which is 9 a.m. until the sixth hour. Excuse me, until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Here he is, 9 a.m. on our clock, the third hour. And here he is, 3 p.m. dying at uh, the uh, ninth hour. Six hours on the cross, Jesus, equivalent to all of humanity going to hell for all of eternity. And we got to figure that out. And how do we know? It comes from the seven comments of Jesus from the cross. Remember, he spoke seven times. Well, we're, let's just review those real quick. Let's uh, popcorn them. What did he say from the cross? Anybody? Ah, uh, forgive them. Now, listen to that. Forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. There's one word missing from that statement. Anybody recognize what word's missing? Exactly. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. That's a very important statement. Father, forgive them. All right, what else did he say from the cross? What was one of the longer statements? Yes, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Maybe he said that. All right, we know he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He said that while he's being nailed. So that had to be the first one. Maybe he said this one second because it's longer and he's more strength. There's a similar one that has some length to it. What did he say? Speaking to the thief, what did he say? Today you will be with me in paradise. Maybe that was the third one. We, we don't know for sure. Okay. All right, there's three. We, we know he said something else. I'm thirsty. And that might have been a little bit later on as he's dehydrating. And they have to moisten his tongue because he's got to declare his next statement, which is, it is finished. Now, he's not talking about his earthly life. Hey, it's over. I'm dying. It's finished. What's he referring to? His mission, exactly. And the word there in Greek is a business term that in essence means paid in full. I, uh, before going to seminary, I was a banker. 
And uh, I was an agricultural lender in a farming bank. So people would come in, a farmer would, and I can remember this one guy. Yeah, oh, this is dairy country, isn't it? Let me tell you a dairy story. All right, so this dairy farmer came in. He was building a new um, milking barn. And he came in, and I'm just right out of college, okay? And uh, he said, uh, I need to renew my note, my production note. And I went to the vault, I got out the note, and I said, this is IBM Selectric typewriter days, not computer days, okay? So I put in a new note, and I said, I gotta put in your file why you are not able to pay your note, your production note off. You gotta pay the interest, but tell me why you're not able to pay. So he said, well, because my herd has gone dry. And I'm typing, herd has gone dry. Okay, now, can you tell me uh, when will they be wet again so that I can put that in your note? And, and I literally said that. And that young farmer, he just laughed and he leaves my office. He goes next door to Ken. Ken was the president of the bank and he was training me to be an agricultural lender. And all of a sudden I heard this raucous laughter in the president's office. And so it's a little town, only four restaurants. I go to get a sandwich at noon. I go in the cafe. I walk in, and they're all, oh, <laughs> So anyway, I, the reason I say that is in the Old Testament, when they, uh, so I would take that note, and I wouldn't stamp paid in full on it. I would put paid by renewal. That's what a banker did, paid by renewal. When he came back six months later and paid it off, paid in full. Think with me, Old Testament, every time they offered a goat, a pigeon, an ox, it was paid by renewal, paid by renewal, paid by renewal. But then John the Immerser says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is on that cross, and he says, it is finished, bam, paid in full, mission accomplished. That is huge. Do not ever forget that. Now, there's more. Stay with me. Father, into your hands. When did he say that? Right here. So maybe it is finished. Uh, excuse me. I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is very important. Father, into your hands. Father, forgive them. Father, Father. There's one statement missing. What? Exactly, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the only statement, the only time Jesus referred to God as God during his entire earthly life, whether he was speaking to him or of him. 12-year-old boy, what's he say to Mary and to Joseph? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Sermon on the Mount. This then is how you should pray, our... Father, who art in heaven. This is the only time. Even the beginning of the cross, Father, forgive them. At the end of the cross, Father, into your hands. Something happened to their relationship during those six hours on the cross. And this is why six hours are equivalent to our eternity in hell. And now notice, my God, my God, there's something there that you and I do not want to miss. When Moses was at the burning bush, Exodus 3, the angel said, Moses, Moses, when Abraham had the knife up above Isaac, what, what was said? Abraham, Abraham. When Samuel the boy was in Shiloh and he went to Eli and he said, go lie down. The Lord's trying to get your attention. And what happened? Samuel, Samuel. Remember when Saul is on the road to Damascus, Acts 9. Saul, Saul, do you see something? The name is, there's a pattern there. If something is repeated in scripture, it is important. If it's repeated, it's important. And we're not only talking about uh, verses or phrases, we're talking about patterns. So if God says, Moses, Moses, Saul, Saul, Samuel, Samuel, and Jesus says, my God, my God, what's behind that? Somebody wants somebody's attention. Jesus wants the attention of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's in that moment that something happened. Are you ready? Here it is. Jesus in Gethsemane, he prays, may this cup pass from me. How many times did he pray that? 
How many? Three times. He prayed the same prayer three times. If it's repeated, it's important. Something in that prayer stands out to us. Father, if it be possible, may this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So when people look at that, they many times, oh, you see that? Jesus, Gethsemane, he wanted out. He didn't want to go to the cross. He's changing his mind. Uh, no, because when did he decide to go to the cross? Before God created planet Earth, before the foundation of the Earth was laid. He's not asking for a pass on the cross. So something else is there in that word cup. If somebody looks up Isaiah 51, 17, this is just one of many uses of that word cup in this regard. Isaiah 51, 17. Anybody got that? Isaiah 51, 17. And remember, Isaiah is written 700 years before Jesus dies. Uh, rouse yourself, rouse yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl of his staggering. The cup of his wrath. wrath. So when he says, may this cup pass from me, he's talking about his wrath. May your wrath pass from me. Now think about that. Theirs was a love relationship. The father loved the son, the son loved the father. At his baptism, you are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. See, Jesus was about to experience something from his father he had never before experienced. And he's saying, all right, your will be done, not mine. So when he is on that cross, Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The wrath, the fury, the rage of God is poured out on Jesus. In that moment, Isaiah 700 years before talks about there came that moment when God laid on him the iniquity of us all that had to happen during the six hours god literally took all of our sins past present and future and put them on his son and they didn't belong there stay with me habakkuk 113 god's eyes are too pure to even look on evil it says so God puts all of the sins of all of us on Jesus. His eyes are too pure to look on evil. He turns his back on his son. All that wrath, all that rage, all that fury, because the wages of sin is death. And Jesus takes the full fury and rage of God, something he never before experienced, and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now here's something more we do not want to miss. What is this festival? Passover. The ninth plague was darkness. How long was it dark? In Egypt. How long was it dark in Egypt? Darkness over all of Egypt except the land of Goshen. Yes, three days. Very good. A pastor's wife comes through. No, yes. He, he said oh, he said it. Good. <laughs> You're listening to the right voice. Yes, very good. So the plague of darkness, and that was when God passed judgment on Egypt. You have rejected me. And it's going to cost you, plague number 10, your firstborn son. It's going to cost you your firstborn son. What happened at the sixth hour when Jesus was on the cross? Darkness covered what? The face of the earth. For how long? Three hours. Isn't that interesting? Darkness. God passed a judgment on all of us. And it cost us his son. How great is the love that God has lavished on us. That we should be called his children and that is what we are so when i take the lord's supper i don't think just about the crown of thorns or the nails i think of the wrath of god 
and I'm hiding behind Jesus on the cross because I would not have survived the wrath of God. That's the full cost. So we're going to take a five-minute break to stretch, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to, in 20 minutes, apply this to life today. Okay? Don't leave the building. Well, you can leave the building, but you're not going to hear part two of why this makes a difference. Okay? All right. So 10 minutes. We're going to be back in our seats at 8 o'clock.
Hey, can I? Um, did your mother teach you to share? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Family. All right, let's uh, talk about what, what, all, what does this mean for us? You know, when we look at the life of Jesus, study of Christ at a deeper place, and, and I hope there might have been just a couple of things there that you had not known before that makes you and I all the more appreciative for what Jesus did for us. Um, so here's the, here's the deal. The question then would be, Jesus knew his mission, he protected that mission, and he was all in to pay for that mission to be accomplished. Do we, the church, know our mission? Are we protecting our mission? And are we all in to pursue that mission? So to unpack some of that, uh, Think about the Black Plague. That I took that picture in Baden, Austria. So you might know about TCM. It's a ministry. There's a seminary outside of Vienna and um, taught there many, many, many a time. And whenever we're on a mission trip to Europe, I many times will take a picture of these. These have been built by the Catholic Church as a shrine saying thank you to God for bringing the Black Plague, the bubonic plague, to an end. Two-thirds of the population of Europe died during the bubonic plague, and it's over. So they built these all over Europe. And every time I see one, I just shake my head because the black plague is alive and well. The churches in Europe are empty. We go to the cathedrals, they're empty. Might, may, might have on a good day 100 people on a Sunday in a cathedral that seats thousands. So that black spiritual plague is all over Europe. It's come across the pond and it has settled over our neighbors to the north called Canada. Uh, been on many mission trips to Canada, more than a dozen. And uh, Kerry Newhoff, you might recognize that name. He's a leader, a Christian leader in Canada. The last time the North American Christian Convention was in Indianapolis, uh, there were a bunch of us sitting down for lunch. Kerry was at the table. I said, hey, Tell me, how many people in Canada now are evangelical Christians? Maybe 20%? And he just laughed. He said, it's identical to England. Not even 5% of the population are believers in Jesus, evangelicals. And you know, over here, Great Britain, back in the mid-1800s, they were the number one missionary sending nation under Queen Victoria. India, China, many parts of Africa, missionaries from Great Britain went with the good news of Jesus. Now, Great Britain needs missionaries. Canada needs missionaries. So that black plague came across the pond, and it settled over our neighbors to the north. And where is it coming? Right here. It's spreading, this black plague. Um, you and I need to think of it this way. So in America, a church has a bell curve. Every church, just like a business, just like a new donut shop, has a bell curve. A church is started, it's launched, and they then will have growth. It's called momentum growth. It's exciting. Uh, but then pretty soon the new will wear off, and then a church needs to do things strategically in order to keep growing and to come to a place of sustained health where we're hitting on all eight cylinders but now today in America, there are about 350 to 375,000 Protestant churches. We have about 5,000 churches in America. We, the Restoration Movement, okay? You add the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Baptists, the Pentecostals. You add all of the Protestant churches together, about 350, 375. 
and the majority of them, 85% of them, are on the wrong side of the bell curve. They are in a maintenance mode. They want to maintain the offering. They want to maintain the attendance. They want to maintain the interest. And of those who cannot maintain, then they are on life support. They don't know if they're going to be open at the end of the week, let alone at the end of the year. And those that cannot stay open today in America, 12 churches a day are now closing in America, 12 a day. So Jeremy, he wanted us to make this an interactive time. He wants us to talk and to think about this. So I'm not asking you to say out loud, you could be thinking about it, but just think where might Sheldon Church of Christ be on that bell curve? Think about that. Where is Sheldon Church of Christ? Okay, so then what I want us just to understand is that we're, we've, we've got quite an arduous task ahead of us. When we just think about our culture, this is what's trending. Here, here are just a few of the trends in our culture. We're living in a post-truth society. So when Jeremy preaches, he's got to understand there are going to be people, not only in Sheldon, but beyond, who do not believe that this book is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God anymore. As a matter of fact, uh, one out of two millennials do not accept this book as uh, absolute unchanging truth. And increasing numbers of Christian Americans are not holding this to be unchanging truth under which to bring their lives uh, uh, under its authority. So this is real challenging. We have to understand that there's massive disrespect for Christianity. People in Hollywood on the West Coast, people in Washington on the East Coast, and to all points in between, there's massive disrespect uh, for Christianity. Yeah. Now, in a Sheldon... You're, you're going to be in a much different kind of a culture, but in, in Indianapolis, they don't want preachers on the school board. We don't want you there. Uh, I'm being summoned to appear for a trial uh, service this next week, jury duty. And I know, I know it's happened time after time. If I'm selected for the jury pool, I'll go in. And then when the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney interview me, I've been rejected over and over and over again. Why? Because I'm a... Preacher, there's just over and again this disrespect for Christianity. Uh, we've lost the next generation. George Barna, uh, their studies and whatnot, this is uh, heartbreaking. Six out of ten young people who are raised in the church leave the church by age 29 if you're coming, uh, oh, wait, no, this is Wisconsin. I'm so coming. So on Friday, Saturday, we'll be doing it again. But Jeremy was with us on Saturday, and he heard some uh, insights on how to reach and keep the next generation. What's next? Taking some bold steps in that regard. We, we've got to do something. There's passive evangelism, meaning that we are passive, we are laid back, uh, and we are... We in the room, we all wear the name Jesus. We are all, all of us should be right up there immersing people into Christ, all of us. We don't hire it done by the preacher. It's the ministry given to us, more on that in just a moment. Lukewarm discipleship, biblical illiteracy is at epidemic rates. People don't know the word of God. They're not reading the word of God. They're not studying the word of God. We have member versus uh, mission-driven churches, I'll explain that in just a moment, three out of ten churches in America are member-driven, one out of ten are mission-driven, and churches, as I said a moment ago, are closing at an ever-increasing rate. So Jeremy or anybody want to chime in, anybody want to share anything? Just I don't want to be Doug the Downer before we leave. Um, we just got to talk about uh, reality. Curtis, anybody? Gary, I would say, I'll give this shout out to this church. Mm -hmm. is I taught an evangelism class, and they have taken that now, and, and many of them now are watching that on 
Sunday mm-hmm. morning. Still, Jeremy? Still. Still. I mean, it was an eight-week class, and they're uh-huh. in week 20. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> so Praise I do, be to God. Yeah, mm-hmm. to yes, order. yes, yes, yes. Training taking place to share one's faith. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Tom Rayner is now retired uh, from LifeWay, but right before his retirement, LifeWay Resources, they did a study in America, and they, they came up with uh, research statistics, signs that a church may be closing sooner than later. So here are the eight signs. Numerical decline in four years. The church does not look like its community, meaning people from the community are not in the church. Uh, Sometimes in a much larger town, uh, people in that neighborhood around the church, whether they're Hispanic, African American, Asian, they're not a part of that church. They don't look like their community, that church. Senior adults are the largest demographic, and senior adults are 55 and older. So what a church does is they look at the birth dates of their membership, and they literally put the oldest member here on a timeline, and they put the youngest member here, that baby in the nursery, and then they calculate where is that average age for the church. And what every church needs to do is move that dot ever younger, 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 younger on that timeline. Every church in America needs to do that. Every church needs to grow young. Uh, Then the focus is on the past, not on the future. That comments, conversation oftentimes is about years gone by. Members are preference driven. It's about what we want the church to do to keep us content, to keep us uh, here. The budget is inwardly focused. It's about us, not about them. And the building has sacred cows. There are things that cannot be changed. Grandpa built that or whatever. Cannot be changed. Uh, Don't you dare change that stage. You know, those silk flowers have been there. My my great-grandma put those up there. Don't you change that. Uh, Sacred cows. And a sacred cow is not only a building, but it's sometimes uh, a service or a time of service. Um, You know, I heard an incredible story from Curtis this week. They wanted to help two churches stay open. And one of their sacred cows was their time of service. And those two churches that were on the verge of closing asked Curtis, can you help us stay open? Curtis bent over backwards to do that, wanted to send a preacher, one preacher on a Sunday, drive in, the towns were close. Could you alter the time of your service? No, can't do that. That's a sacred cow. They would rather close than change in order to stay open when somebody was trying to be helpful. Um, And then finally, change is greatly resisted. Those were the eight measured traits of a church that would close sooner than later in America. Now, looking at that list of eight, what they found out was this, a church with four or more of those signs would close sooner than later with four or more. And um, so a church would have one of three options. They could, number one, cast vision, pursue mission, get on mission, seek and save the lost, make disciples of all ethnics, all nations, ethnos, ethnic groups, implement change, make changes in order to connect with broken, hurting, lost people. Make changes. That's one option. A second option, they could close, they could reopen, they could merge, they could rebrand. And that's happening in many places across America. You know, in Indianapolis, uh, in our metro, we have a, we're about a million people in our metro. And when it comes to our churches, we have between 60 and 65 Christian churches, restoration churches, just in our city. And many of them are several thousand in size. Uh, I call Indianapolis the Jerusalem of the West. And But some of our churches now are 25, 30 in number, and they are merging with other Christian churches so that there can still be a church in that place, and they're becoming a satellite. 
of other churches. So that's happening in different places. The third option is to do nothing and close, and that is indeed happening. So, uh, yeah, come on, buddy. Yeah. So, are there any of those that really stick out to you? Of those eight? Third one. Yeah. Senior adult. All right. So, focus on the past. Anything else? Our budget, just so you know, our budget is mostly inwardly focused. If you look at our $180,000 budget, I would say for programs, now hourly focused, I would say that is right around 15 to 20,000. Um, yeah. Family. No. So, but anyway, this is what I want you to realize. Um, I think the biggest one or the hardest one for us to change, I think, is turning the back, turning back the clock on the youth of our congregation. I believe that's our biggest challenge. And I'm going to say this as kindly as I can. In order for us to turn that back, we're going to have to give up some of our personal sacred cows in order for us to be purposeful about reaching the people that we need and are called to be. And that's a struggle for all of us. But it's not just going to happen. It has to be purposeful. And in order for it to be purposeful, it means it has to be personal sacrifice for us to be able to do this. Personal sacrifice of your preferences, but also personal sacrifice of your time and personal sacrifice of your comfort. Because you might have to have people in your home because guess what? I like what Gary said on Saturday. You're better off bringing them to your home around your table than bringing them here to sing to Jesus when they don't know who Jesus is. If we want this church, because in 20 years if things don't change, we're going to have five of those things. Hmm. We just have to be honest. And so we're going to have to be purposeful on how we're going to move forward here. And it's not just the leadership's job. It's our job to set where we're going, but we only do it if everybody jumps on board and does their part mm -hmm. and jumps on board and helps out and jumps on board and does different things so we can spread our ministry out rather than waiting for people to come in. Mm -hmm. Because people don't think I have a problem and I'm going to call the pastor anymore. That was 25, 40, 60 years ago. They only do that if we have a relationship. But now they're going to call you instead. Well, they might not even call you. You'll just have to go to their house and say how you're doing. It's going to start with relationships. And so that's something I really want you to take away tonight is what are we going to do to bring this back younger? And the only way it's going to bring back younger is if all of us get on board and really make an effort to invite friends and people that are younger, not your friends, of your neighbors. Bonnie's been working hard with her neighbor over and over. And you know, and some of the rest of you have, have neighbors and try and get the kids into the youth program. But I'll tell you what, we barely have enough people to staff our youth program. If we didn't have two or three families called the Allergen to sell us, we would be hurting on our youth program. So if we want younger, that means we need help. And so it's not going to happen naturally. And that's what I want you guys to think about, is how can you step forward and help you? Because um, we all need to be on the same team. I'm done. Well, stay up front because uh, stay right there. There's going to be a slide or two that you do that so very well. Okay, you're going to do it again. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. So we already did that. Now. Uh, a moment ago, I said that three out of four churches are member-driven, and one out of four churches are on a mission to seeking to save lost people, their next-door neighbor, their co-worker, etc. Uh, and what you and I need to ask is, do we know our mission? 
And our mission, every believer, is to connect with broken, hurting, lost people who are far from God. We don't hire preachers to do it. It's all of our responsibility. It's a privileged responsibility. Now, just a little compare and contrast. What is a mission-driven church? What's a member-driven church? So a member-driven church is, hey, come and see. A mission-driven church is go and be the hands and feet of Jesus. So just real quick, here, here's compare and contrast. A, a member-driven church attracts people, but a mission-driven church serves people. Member-driven, hey, we hire a gifted staff to serve us. But a mission-driven, we are all gifted. Every believer has a gift. 1 Peter 4.10, each person should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve others. All of us got a gift. Uh, we come to a building in a member-driven church, but in a mission-driven church, we leave the building. We get out of the salt shaker. We're the salt of the earth. We get out of the salt shaker to benefit uh, the lives of people. We have an inward focus on the save. What are you going to do for me? What are you going to do for my kids? What are you going to do, et cetera, et cetera. But in a mission-driven church, the, there's an outward focus on people who are yet to be saved. See, somebody already led you and me to Jesus, and now we get to pay it forward. Uh, there's a two-and-a-half tribe mentality in a member-driven church. What does that mean? Remember the uh, 12 tribes when God said, go in there, enjoy the promised land, uh, cross the Jordan. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Two-and-a-half tribes said, uh, no. We'll help you take the land, but when it's all taken, we're, we're going to live east of the Jordan. Not only did that have to have broken the heart of Moses, but whose heart? God's heart. And that, that mentality is human nature. It's alive and well today across America in the American church. Nope, not going to do that. Nope. I don't, no. Serve those kids? Help on Wednesday night? Nope, not going to do it. Nope, nope. Let somebody else do it. I did, I, I did my, my share years ago. Uh, but in a mission-driven church, here I am, Lord, uh, send me. Isaiah said that uh, long ago. And while you and I have the breath of life, we're meant to bring glory to God on the day that he allowed us to live one more day. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Always remember, that's the whole reason why we exist. In Isaiah 43, verse 7, God says, You who I called, whom I formed and made for my glory. You and I have been created and kept alive one more day for one purpose, and that's to bring God glory with our lives. And it, all of us have a gift, and a gift is meant to be given. So what are we, are we holding on to it, or are we laying it before the throne of God in service? In a member-driven church, people resist change. In a mission-driven church, they implement change to stay on mission. In a member-driven church, there are consumer preferences. I'm not going to sing their music. In a mission-driven church, hey, let's just sing to Jesus. Doesn't matter what we sing, an old hymn, a new chorus, doesn't matter. But we want to do what Jesus prefers. You want to talk about that before we uh, have a couple more slides and call it a night? Um, which one are you? I don't want to talk about the church here. My question is, which one are you? Do you tend to be more member? you tend to be more mission because the church is the people. It, it, it's, it's not necessarily leadership can say, here we go. But if you're not going to follow, then we're going to. So my question is, which one do you line up under the most? Because my second question is, is that where Jesus is calling us to be? Is that what Jesus is calling you to be? When we did the sermon series a couple of times ago, and there was that, that part when we went through Colossians 1, mm. and when we went through that, there was the part where God has this amazing, he wants us to experience abundantly. He, he wants us to grow in the knowledge and all mm -hmm. those things. But there's that one part that is always the catch, and that's you have to follow him humbly. Mm -hmm. And my question is, are you following him humbly or are you following them humbly according to what's comfortable or easy? Because sometimes we can get mixed up. Moses got mixed up. David got mixed up. 
Samuel got mixed up. Aaron got really mixed Elijah. up. Elijah. Yeah, Aaron, we don't need to talk about Aaron. And <laughs> you, you, you have, you have Peter. You got James and John. They got mixed up with their own motives, and it caught them. And there is consequences. And I don't know if you realize this, but the consequences of becoming more member than mission is that it costs the church. It costs our community. It costs our unity. And it costs souls. We have to be very careful about how we process what we're going to do as a church. I think God has amazing... I tell you this all the time. And you're like, hey, there he goes again. But I really believe God has amazing. We're going to do this addition. And we got plans for a sanctuary. We can fill that sanctuary. Mm -hmm. I truly believe we can be a church of two to 300 people. Easily. I did a count on, I told you this on Sunday, I did a count of our neighboring communities. Within 20 miles, we got up 12 to 13,000 people. And within 20 miles, the amount of people that go to church, maybe a thousand. Biggest church is 200 out of that 20 miles. There might be only one or two of us. We have been given a mission. The question is, where do you line up and what are you willing to do to fulfill the commission God's given us? I don't know. That's the discussions we have to have, and that's the prayers you have to start praying. Good job. I'll keep it. <laughs> You're doing great. So the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and what? Make disciples. And how do we do that? We immerse them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We teach them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. We call that the Great what? Great Commission. And the Great Commission has been given to every senior minister in America today, right? It's been given to every Christian in America. By whom? Jesus. So if you and I wear that name, Christian, I-A-N, and we're a follower of Christ, all of us are to be out connecting with broken, hurting people who desperately need Jesus, all of us. And we don't need to be intimidated by it because the Great Commission comes with a great companion. And surely I will be with you... Always, Jesus is with us in this. We have nothing to be afraid of. So what you and I want to remember is this. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you something incredibly true. Leah and I saw this on the Discovery Channel, so I know it's true, all right? And while we were watching it about 10 years ago, 8 years ago, I said, man, that'll preach. And she goes, promise me you'll never tell that. And I go, oh, of course I will. I'll just keep it clean because we're in church. Ready? Here we go. So here's the church version. This is what the Discovery Channel said. So a boy octopus meets a girl octopus. They start dating, they fall in love, and they get engaged. And they plan the wedding, they have the wedding, and then after the wedding, they go on their honeymoon, and they do it. That's all I'm going to say, all right? They do it. And after Mr. Octopus does it for the first First and only time in his life, first and only time, he dies. Literally, after doing it once. All right, so now we got a young widow on her honeymoon, and she's going to have babies, lots of them, octopi. And after she gives birth to the babies, this young widow, and she gets them all potty trained, then mom dies, and they eat her. The babies eat their mother. And this is true. An octopus mates once and then dies. Reproduces once and then dies. And Leah goes, how will that preach? And I go, simple. Who made that creature? God. And what did God put in that creature? A desire to reproduce once before death. What if every Christian on planet Earth reproduced once? brought one person to Jesus, immersing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then taught them to obey all that Jesus taught them. And then that person went and brought one person to Jesus. And that person went and brought one person to Jesus. If that happened here with all of us, 
you had better build that expansion very quickly. You'd be in two, three, four services. This is called the law of geometric multiplication. Dr. Uh, Jim Dennison, he's a pastor and author in Texas. He has this incredible blog. I read it every, it comes up Monday through Friday. Last fall, he did an analysis. He said, if every Christian took seriously the Great Commission, commission and just brought one person to Jesus, it would take, are you ready for this? To reach every person on planet Earth right now, nearly 8 billion people, it would take 33 days. If every person did what Jesus commanded. And it's, it's a command, it's not an option. Uh, a young man is underneath that car. Uh, I don't have the video of it right now, but his name is Brandon Wright. He's 21 years old, student at Utah State University. I'm going to fast forward to the end. A group of people came around that car. They were screaming to help him. He's alive but unconscious. And about 15 people lifted that car. I, I watched it in the video, and they pull him out, and he lives. About 15 days later, he's released from the hospital after several surgeries. They caught him on the evening national news, and he's sobbing. He said, I would be dead. I would have burned to death had you not come and saved me. And I thought immediately of Jude, the book of Jude, verse 24. We live to snatch people from the flames. That's what we do. And so who is the lost person on your mind? Who's the lost person on my mind that I'm building a friendship with? Hoping to build a friendship with, uh, inviting that person into my life, into my home. Want his feet under my table, he and his wife, unsaved people. Come on over, let's do life together. I cannot invite them to church unless I first invite them into my life. Um, so healthy things grow. That's what we're talking about. So healthy things grow. And when we get healthy and we begin growing, growing things are going to change. If you got kids, they're growing. If you got grandkids, they're growing. And things are going to change. And then change challenges us. When that little three-year-old becomes 13, there's one challenge after another, right? Uh, <laughs> Curtis says amen. So change challenges. So when 100 people here becomes 300. Your pastor's got a great vision. You easily could be a church of 200 to 300 people, truly. And things are gonna change. It's gonna be a challenge. We had 250 people when we went to the creek 30 years ago, 5,000 when I handed the baton off. When we got healthy, we began what? Growing. And did we have to change? Oh yeah. And it was a challenge for a whole lot of people. And then challenges, they force us to what? Trust God. God's got this. This is God's plan. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We can trust Him. And when we trust Him, that leads to obedience. When we know that we can trust God, we're going to obey God. We're going to take so seriously this commission that He's given to us. And when we obey God, what does He do? He pours out his favor on us. And what do we keep doing? We keep growing and growing and growing. So that's what it looks like to be a healthy church that's living on mission. We've got all this head knowledge now about Jesus on mission. We need to move that head knowledge right here for his glory and honor. And that's what it looks like to be a healthy church. I'm all done. Um, Evan and Henry, can you go to the back and get those pens and index cards, please? I'm going to give you two cards. And a pen, if you have a pen, I, you guys turned out. I'm so happy. Um, I'm, I'm very, very humbled by how many of you actually <laughs> listen to my request. It doesn't always happen that way. So um, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. She sits in the front row for a reason. So go ahead. Everybody gets two um, index cards. And then um, if you have a pen, you can share a pens. We'll have to share those. Um, this is what I'd like you to do with those two cards. The first card is for you to take home. 
And in that first card, um, I want you to do two things on that. The first one is goes back to what we did in January when we talked about the great banquet and we handed out um, we handed out these place settings of the China with the cup and everything, and there was an invitation of those three people. I want you to re recommit. I want you to write all three or at least one name, but here's the thing. I want them to be local. I want that person to be local. I keep praying for your family and for your kids and all those, but I want you to think about locally who can you reach. So I want you to put a name on. The second thing is, what's the biggest obstacle to you from what we've said? Because I've been a little forthright. And um, there might be a little tension on the inside. And um, the only way that tension can be resolved is not by listening to me anymore because I'm the cause of it, but rather by lifting it up to God in prayer and saying, God, how do I work through this? What do you want me to do? And so if there's an obstacle, something that was said or something that you're like, I, I know I should, but I don't. I want you to write that down. I want you to start praying over that one thing, okay? Um, the second card is for this. What I would like you to do with the second card is that I would like you to write one or two things, and this is your message to the church leaders. I want you to write a note to the church leaders of what you see is important for our church. I, 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 we, we need to hear from you. We, we can't lead blindly. We need to hear your heart. We need to hear your passions. And so if there's something that jarred you or came to mind, I would like you to write a message to the church leaders. Uh, some, And it can just be a thought, a summation. We need to, or I would like, or an idea, something. And I'm going to, we're going to pray before we do this, or you might already start. That's fine. And I'm, we're going to just spend about 10 minutes seconds, not minutes, 10 seconds in silence. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit just to reveal to us those things. And the way the Holy Spirit reveals a lot of time is through a thought, a flash, a picture, a word, a name, those type of things. And if that comes up and you know it didn't come from you, it came from God. Okay. And it might not be a natural feeling or a natural thought, but I want us to be open to what the Holy Spirit might lead right now. So let's just um, have a little prayer. I'm going to pause for a while, and then I'll close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you right now, and we're so thankful that Gary could come and share um, his wealth of knowledge, his insight, but also challenge us, challenges as followers of you your beloved children. And Lord, our desire is to give you everything because you've given us all we need. Your love, your acceptance, your salvation, your spirit, your word, your hope, and so much more. And so Lord, right now we just come to you and as we think about our, our church here and our mission here in Sheldon and the surrounding communities, Lord, I just ask right now that you might reveal to us, Holy Spirit, reveal to us a name of who we are to reach, but also, Lord, reveal to us right now that obstacle that you're calling for us to identify, repent, work through, humble, or fight for. So Holy Spirit, reveal that to us now. And Holy Spirit, right now we lift up our church, and as we prepare this statement for the church leaders, or what it is, Lord, once again, we ask that the Holy Spirit might connect our passion and how you made us and how we see the world around us. Lord, um, work in such a way in which that might come out in this statement, so that it might be a heartfelt desire for our church to reach the mission and to give you the glory that you deserve. So Holy Spirit, Reveal that to us now. And Lord, we thank you for what you've given us. But Lord, 
we are excited for what you're going to do ahead of us. We're excited. We wait in expectation. Your promises are true. Your word is solid. And your passion for people is so real. And so, Lord, help us partner with you. Help us see the world as you see it, broken and lost. And Lord, may we just have a hunger, a passion, a desire to do something that is beyond us, where only it can be accredited to you. So, Lord, use us as a body, as a family, and as your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what you can do is, um, for those of you who have free cookies coming to you, um, feel free to take one as you leave. Um, I, um, otherwise, I will eat them tomorrow. And um, that's not good for your pastor. So um, if you have the cards, go ahead and write down your cards. We'll just give a couple minutes for that. Chad, did you get some cards back there? Did they skip you? Oh. Can't have that. Go ahead and put it back there. And put it on the back table. Yeah. Okay, so the two cards. I just talk so much, it gets foggy. So the two cards, the first one is for yourself to take home. It is a name of someone local that you feel that you need to reach out to, show God's love, give an opportunity to reach. The second one is something that might be an obstacle to you fulfilling the mission that God wants to do through you. So it might be a topic, it might be a hesitancy, it might be a fear, it might be whatever it is, it might be something that you need to pray because that's holding you back from the mission that God has called you to. Okay, so th that's the first one. The second card is a message that you would like to send to our church leaders about anything that was said tonight. Any questions? All right, there's going to be a basic basket on the table right back there as you leave with beautiful light green tissue paper that mom put in. So um, anyway, so you have that. Um, take your time filling out. If you're done, thank you so much for coming. I so appreciate you. I love you guys more than you will ever realize. Uh, that is a true statement. And so thank you for all that you do for the church, the way that you lift Jennifer and I up in prayer. We love you guys and we appreciate you. And thank you for being on the same team as us because uh, I wouldn't want anybody else on my team. So, all right. Have a great night. Thank you. We will see you Sunday morning and um, bring five friends. Have a good night.